Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Survey Design That Uncovers What Your Customers Are Truly Thinking. I'm Tracy Dempsey, VP of Customer Success here at Suzy. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that integrates quant, qual, and high-quality audiences into a single connected research cloud. And I'm excited to be joined here today by Will Cimarosa, our SVP of Market Research. Will, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Tracy. Um, I've been in the market research industry for over 15 years now um, on a, with a good mix of both client and vendor side. I've been with Suzy just over two years, um, and I've been really working to build out new use cases, features, and functions um, that make Suzy more impactful for you and your business questions. Awesome. I can vouch for that. Will is definitely one of our go-tos within Suzy for all his market research knowledge and has such a wealth of knowledge. And so we're really excited to share some of that with you today. Um, so let's get started on sort of the first section here where we wanted to talk a little bit about, um, or a lot, about survey design. So I'd like to start off with some of the basics. So Will, what do you think is the most important thing someone needs to know when they're building a survey? <sighs> So like survey design and survey writing is like a, an entire art or an entire like, you know, subsection of, of, of like things you could learn, right? You could, you're always working on your skills if you're a survey writer. Um, some of the key things that I would start with is that perspective, right? Really have the perspective that what you're doing involves a lot of science and a lot of art, right? How you're going to actually phrase and design your survey. Um, in order to actually design a survey, the first thing that I would do is stick to the fundamentals, and that's really focus on what the business question is. Research questions and business questions aren't always the same. A lot of times the market researcher is given a business question that you have to translate over into a research question. And that's easy to lose sight of, of what the actual business question is. So always keep that in mind as you get started, because keeping that in mind is going to make sure that you know who the right person is to talk to when you're developing a screener. You need to have an audience taking your survey that's reflective of some sort of reality that you're answering for the business. What's the best way for you to go about measuring, you know, what it is that the consumers have to say in the survey so, so you can actually answer it and then finally report and tell a story. Yep, that totally makes sense. And I know um, as we're working with our clients here at Suzy, we always kick off with a research brief that asks those exact questions. So um, Great starting point. Let's talk a little bit now about designing those survey questions. Um, where, where, where do we start? The first thing that I would start when getting ready to actually write the questions that respondents are going to respond to is keeping in mind um, what respondents are good at answering and what they're not good at answering. There's a whole range of things that are impacting your subconscious that make it hard for you to answer certain questions. Sometimes it's things like about a why, particularly why you do things. Every day you're being impacted by all different types of, of influences. What consumers are good at, at answering, and there's there's volumes of research on this, is about experiences they've had, right? The, the human animal is one that, that is all about experiences and those usually end up developed into stories, right? So consumers are very good at, at responding and reacting to experiences. Um, let's talk that from there, once you understand that they can respond well to experiences, you're not always necessarily getting the direct answers to the business questions you might have, which allows you to then derive what those answers would be. And let's let's go through a little exercise about derived analytics, um, you know, so, so that this becomes, we're all on the same page. This is a, a facetious exercise um, and it's a simple one, um, but let's start this off. I'm gonna create an experience. I want you to imagine that this experience is something that we've got business questions about, right? Um, just, just bear with me here for this little experiment and try not to write anything down. The experience really is simple. It's going to just be me reading some words out loud. You ready? Vacation. <laughs> Swimming. Heat. Bathing suit. Ice cream. Laughing. Breeze. Refreshing. Splashing. Bubbles, sand, towel, picnic, games, and water. Okay. What words do you remember? Right. That was that was a very simple experience. Just some visuals and some sounds. Right. But consumers are having experiences all day, every day. Some tied to brands. Some tied to need states. 
that are impacting the way they perceive and the way they actually behave when it comes to buying and interacting with brands, right? Well, what I'm showing here is a picture of a pool. And I'm right next to it, I'm showing all the words that were shown. Um, you'll notice that the word pool isn't there. Perception is reality, right? And, and you have to remember that consumers are really the sums of all the experiences that they've had. These experiences have, have been built over time. It's not that you know, uh, these words have misled consumers into, you know, thinking that there's a word pool. It's just associated with a lot of the words that they saw. They've had a lot of pool experiences that are related to bathing suits and breeze and splashing, right? These recall experiences that are related, right? That's why we're going to call this a pool experience, right? When we played this game with, with over 5,000 students and we asked them 45 minutes after having that experience that you just had, 64% of them recalled the word pool. That's a word that's not there, right? And over half recalled the word beach, more than a quarter the word camp. And even more interesting is 73% couldn't recall more than four words, right? If I were to ask a consumer, what was the main thing that made you think of the word pool or the barrier to you know the word pool or what prevented you from recalling the words beach or camp, right? How would you do that, Tracy? I, sorry. Melissa. You don't know, right? You can't do it. That's the whole point. But consumers take surveys and they'll tell you something, right? They'll, they'll give you an answer. But the truth is they don't really know what it is about why they do something, right? But they are very good at telling us about vacation experiences or swimming experiences or times they experienced heat or times that they've had, you know, experience wearing a bathing suit, right? And this is important, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're going to answer business questions, you have to be able to answer things about behavior that eventually impact your brand, right? We here demonstrated how to create a pool experience. Fundamentally, this has got to be the same thing as creating a brand loyalty experience, a satisfaction experience, or deconstructing a satisfaction experience. So you can understand what's driving a specific behavior. I think I'm following you, Will. So first of all, I thought of beach in your example. That was the first word that came to my mind. But um, I'm curious, as what you're saying it really sounds to me like is there's a quantitative way or a, a way that you can survey to really get at the crux of why consumers behave the, the way that they do. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And you can do that by focusing on the experiences that are easier for them to answer, right? If, if I were to have a, a list of, of options of the things that, you know, you most associate with a beach experience, they would almost certainly be quite different than what the results of that study were, right? Um, and what's critical is understanding how to identify what the most important attributes or experiences are to shaping that outcome. What, are, what was it that created a beach or a pool experience? And how is that different for different consumers? Super interesting. I and mean, where do you where do you start with something like that? Like, I usually start with someone from a commercial team telling me that at the end of the day, this sounds very academic. How is this going to help me with my business? Right. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's really about behaviors around purchase behavior. Right. So if I'm going to be looking at great ways to start to frame a survey that's going to answer most effective effectively a range of business questions. Start to think about the experiences that are relevant to brands. And there's there's really three of them, right? Even though you're getting bombarded with all kinds of messages and experiences every day, what are the ways that someone felt or the experiences they had when they went from not buying a per, uh, product category to buying a product category, brand trial? What are all the experiences you know that they've had that led to them buying a brand again or switching brands, right? These are things that can be unpacked by remembering some of the principles that we just had with this pool experience. If I can deconstruct a pool experience, what is a brand loyalty or a brand switch experience, right? And we need to do that by thinking about day-to-day -day life. What are the experiences that we can ask respondents? And if we're starting off on survey questions, we should start to think about things that they can easily answer, experiences that relate to their consumer state. These are things that describe how they feel physically or emotionally at a given time. Um, their perceptions, how do they perceive a brand, what the brand does, or maybe even what it stands for, and what else have they interacted with? Like how relevant are different touch points to them? They're always having these experiences, right? So let's create a range of experiences in a survey that's easy for someone 
to tell you how important it is, right? Or how frequent it is, or how much they agree or disagree. A lot of the things you're saying, Will, it, um, I see a lot of our customers using more qualitative research to answer a lot of those questions. So when would you use sort of the approach that you're suggesting versus a qualitative approach like an IDI or focus group? It really depends on where you are in terms of the depth of the knowledge you have, right? I think qualitative research and quantitative research are the best when they work together, right? Qual is very much about understanding the qualities or the values that are important to people in their own words, in their own language, right? You get this through talking to people. Um, you can't do this necessarily at scale. There's forms of social listening that you could argue that does, but qual is really about discovery, right? And learning what are the ins and outs of a product category. Quantitative or qualitative should lead to a bunch of, of hypothesis about what's driving a category or a hypothesis about a specific business or research question. Quantitative research is best for actually answering it. You can identify a whole range of patterns that are very relevant to a brand, to consumer behavior, but until you quantify it, you don't know what the, which of those behaviors are going to be most important or impactful for your brand. Mm -hmm. I can show you some examples of qualitative uh, statements that might come out of qual and then how they can be turned into a question that could be used for quant, right? Here's two illustrative examples, right? Now I've highlighted in purple the questions, right? Imagine you've had qual where you've talked to a, a whole range of people about their health and wellness in relation to vitamins, minerals, and supplements, right? Wellness, we see a lot of wellness research going on these days, right? You can say, you can actually hear them talking about, well, I, you know, I don't know what's going on with my health. You can hear a whole range of, of, of consumers talking about not feeling like they're in control, right? It's a theme that's, that we've seen emerge from a lot of qual, but until I actually measure it at a quantitative scale, I, I won't know. And without being leading or biasing, I can actually frame this as a statement that someone else has said, right? Here's a range of statements people have made about their attitudes. I feel there's little I can do to control my overall health and wellness. Right? This person or this statement is negatively inclined towards that control, but the consumer is given the opportunity to strongly agree or to strongly disagree. Right? This is how we can measure a theme that we're, we're hearing in the consumer's own words, take a statement, almost a snippet, if you will, from qual, and see how much reach and how strongly do they agree to that. Interesting. So where do you, you know, come up with the initial themes like to even start with? Again, it depends on what the level of, of understanding is that you have, right? Some ways that I would look at themes is starting with category attitudes, right? That's a, a, how do people feel about the actual categories that, you know, itself, right? And then I would start to think about the different product experiences from a functional and an emotional standpoint, and then look at all the different ways someone could actually perceive the brand itself. You think of these almost as modules, right? And I can show you some examples here, right? You've got some examples of the ways that you could word this. You can have a module that speaks to the attitudes and beliefs about the specific category. You could have statements about experiences where are what which are defined by usage occasions. What was someone needing at that moment? You could have frequency questions. How often do you experience these needs? When you actually then transition to another module that could be about the way the product actually makes you feel when you use it. You could be about all the different functional benefits that you have, the things that it does, and ultimately the way that it makes you feel. Other great sources of inspiration for questions about and experience-based questions can then be also about brand perceptions and brand performance, right? How does a brand actually perform against the perceptions that someone could agree or, or disagree to? Super interesting. And I see um, I see in here you talk a little bit about the survey respondent experience, um, and that's why you break these up into modules so that it's not fatiguing on the respondent. Yeah. One thing that, since I've joined Susie, that um, I'm constantly reminded of is how short the consumer attention span has gotten. <laughs> and I, I, we all experience it, right? Like we know that we know that this is a reality. And one of the best practices, especially when it comes to writing a survey, beyond just the, the experiential component of that you're asking about, but you also have to think about the experience of the survey itself. And I find once you get above five minutes, you get start to get a lot of drop-offs and the quality of the responses tend to, to go down. 
So if you're going to do a complicated study, for example, maybe a driver study that we'll talk about where you want to do all three of these things, I strongly recommend breaking it up into modules. There's a, a whole bunch of platforms out there or ways that you could do this. On our platform, you can target back, right? So you can make sure that the same respondents that took one survey are the ones that are taking the next one and give them a break, modulize it up, right? So that you don't start to get a drop off at the end of a 15 or 20 minute survey. It's just become a lot to expect from consumers these days. I think we can all agree that everyone's attention spans are much, much shorter these days. Um, so another question. Um, so I know that at Suzy, we talk a lot about these sort of four pillars of research. So thinking about a product um, or research life cycle from um, the beginning, foundational studies, understanding the consumer to innovation and R&D to um, you know, shopper and tracking and creative and advertising. So can you talk a little bit about these pillars and sort of where the type of research that we're talking about fits into each of these um, or how they fit into each of these pillars. Sure. I, right now, what we're talking about is just really how to frame questions around experiences. And I would argue that they can be relevant and should be relevant across all the pillars, right? A lot of times, if you do a really good job up front and you get a good foundational understanding of what drives your consumer's behaviors, Right. You can start to leverage certain understandings and how you evaluate innovation you may be working on, campaign, you know, articulations, or even what it is that you track. Right. But the fundamental approach of understanding what drives consumers' experiences and what experiences are important is relevant across the board. Foundational studies should tell you who your consumer is and what motivates them and, and what are the motivations that are offer the greatest opportunity. Your innovation should really pick up you know, the, the baton from there. All right. I now know what's important to my consumers and I know the, the size of prize of these consumers. Well, let's start to develop innovation that that creates these experiences that are important to consumers. Does, does it really change much once you get to developing in market support, right? You have to articulate what your brand stands for, what the products do and how they're going to make consumers feel just like the innovation responsibilities are, right? You need to figure out how to, to start to bring this idea that's an innovation to market. If you understand who the consumer is and what levers to pull, you're just going to be that much more effective at doing so. Also, if you understand who your consumer is and what's important to them and what behaviors are, are driving your business, especially if it comes to business growth, you should be tracking it, right? So, so having a foundational understanding Let's you understand, you know, the who, what, where's, and why's. Who is it that I'm, I'm going to win with? What is it and why do I need to create this innovation? And how do I actually start to articulate this, right? Then you should start to track those fundamentals so you know when is the time for a new product line offering or when is the time to, to freshen up our, our messaging. Mm -hmm. Yep, makes sense. Um, and I'm curious because I, I know that, we see our clients doing a lot of um, different types of research, like monadic tests or um, testing claims in, you know, a ranking question or a max diff or doing an ANU study. So these types of um, typical um, research studies that we see, where do they sort of fit into the picture also um, compared to what you're talking about? Yeah, it's, they're all, it's all part of that different ways of measuring what's important, right? A max different or a max differentiation allows you to reduce a list of a lot of options down to a few by forcing consumers to choose the, the most or least, right? Uh, a driver's analysis, which we've been seeing a lot of, allows you to identify and understand what drives specific behaviors so that you can start to create better innovation and better campaigns and even understand what it is that should be tracked, right? So it all depends on ultimately what the business objective is at that time. Innovation is about identifying what is the right product line and product mix. Campaign research is the best way to get people aware of it and to start to see your brand in the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I know, I know, Will, that you have um, a case study that um, you're willing to share with us today that kind of helps us look at all of this and how it all comes together. Would you be willing to go ahead and t take us through that a bit? Sure. I'd be happy to. So let's take a look at um, some work we did that that addresses all of those research pillars, really, right? It's a, it's a foundational study that looks at what drives behavior, right? And in this case, we used the module approach. Um, the, the question at hand was really about 
um, vitamins, minerals, and, and just wellness behaviors. We've been seeing a lot of need around that. You know, it's, we're back to school. It's fall when people are getting sick. We're on the back end of a pandemic. This is, this is stuff that's very relevant to a lot of different consumers. And what we did was we created a range of attributes um, for, uh, you know, to understand the attitudes and statements and occasions that are relevant to people who are buying and using these products. We developed a range of attribute statements that respondents could rank in terms of importance, right, and in relevance um, in terms of both the functional needs as well as the emotional needs of these products. And then we also looked at the way they perceived different brands in the category, right? We then added what I call a dependent variable. And this is, this is critical, right? So we've got all of this information about their attitudes and, and the functional and emotional benefits and how they perceive the brand, right? But we asked a couple of specific questions that we now want to derive from all the experience data that we collected around satisfaction, right? What, what, what's predictive of, of being satisfied with your brand, as well as what is predictive of, of getting someone to add to their basket, to, to buy another um, to buy another uh, product, you know, vitamin, mineral supplement. The way we did that at the end of the study is we used a regression and a gradient boost, right? We asked top two, seven box scale, how satisfied are you with your current vitamin? How likely are you to add another vitamin to your routine? You can see here, six and seven on a seven box scale. We looked at all the different data points, you know, ran a regression line through it, which then started a gradient boost model, which is predictive of the experiences from the survey that are most predictive specifically of satisfaction and likelihood to try something new. Would you like to see some results? Yes. <laughs> I'm on pins and needles over here. So after all that, right, we have, we've now fielded over 214 statements about a range of different category attitudes, functional and emotional benefits. And we derived what it was that was predictive of satisfaction and of someone wanting to expand their, their vitamin, mineral, or supplement repertoire, right? We used that gradient boost tool, and we were able to then narrow down out of 214 statements. We did use the module approach so that we didn't make everyone bored. Um, <laughs> 11 statements or experiences, remember, these are experiential statements that were predictive of satisfaction, and 13 statements that were predictive of, you know, someone whose top two box score was to want to add to their repertoire. I've bolded here just for convenience, the, dupe, the ones that were relevant to both, right? You can start to now see what the business impact is of this survey design or approach. I've narrowed down from over 200 experiences, the ones that are most critical for satisfaction and likelihood to add to your basket. And I've even been able to show where some of the most relevant overlaps are. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I can see, I'm, I'm assuming that this data was probably used then to um, help create more effective advertising messages, marketing messages, and so forth. Is there any other application here for this data? Yeah, one of the things that I think is critical to keep in mind is what this actually means, right? So this isn't stated data. This isn't consumer said, I'm satisfied because X, Y, and Z, or this is most important. This was derived through advanced analytics, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, what's critical to understand is the context that this provides if you are going to create innovation or have to develop some sort of creative as asset, right? It tells you what's most important to these, these people, even when they can't tell you that themselves. And there's some interesting elements here, right, that are bolded, which because they're, they're relevant to both satisfaction and people willing to grow what they're buying and taking, right? And what's interesting here is we see that, you know, VMS is about feeling in control, right? That's, that's a very interesting thing. So right off the bat, that's an insight that you should keep in mind when going to put pen to paper, whether it's for innovation or creative, right? A brand I trust is predictive of, of satisfaction or someone wanting to try that new brand, right? It's recommended by experts, good value for money, and interestingly, makes you feel like you're correcting unhealthy choices that have been made in the past, right? So, the, so this, is, this should be an insight that changes the way that you look at your target consumer. These are experiences that you should now be looking to take advantage of either from terms of context or what it is that the product's actually going to do. If you're going to be talking about innovation, it's what's predictive of someone adding to that basket is that it's a well-known brand. It's number eight here, right? Or it's a brand that's scientifically advanced. Um, you know, makes products that are clinically proven, right? Helps me recover from an injury or an illness. 
This is critical to keep in mind as context, but also what you should probably be talking about, right? If you're going to be talking about campaign components or if you're going to be talking about you know, innovation. We also look at different elements that were overstated in terms of those category attitudes, right? These are people who are more likely to introduce new healthy habits than unhealthy ones, right? P these consumers don't feel like their health and wellness is completely under control. They don't necessarily feel like they're in control over their health and wellness. This is an insight that, that needs to be considered critical context for how you start to bring your brand to the market, right? These are people who are looking for shortcuts, right? People who are looking to avoid medicine. This all becomes context, right? So the first thing is it's important that the people who are responsible for creating innovation or, or for supporting the brand and creating assets really understand what are the experiences critical to having a satisfactory experience or, or you know, creating interest in trying something new, right? We can be very prescriptive, right? Here's a, a worksheet. What we've done here is we've created a facetious example of, of you know, to, to write a concept statement. You know, the traditional, most classic concept statement has a opening insight statement with a description, your points of differentiation, your reasons to believe, you know, a snazzy closing line and a price. And all we've done here is list out all of the different, you know, drivers of, you know, in this case, adoption. Does the concept communicate these top drivers or is it relevant to how these consumers are feeling? Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Um, one question that I thought of on the last slide is, you know, popped in my head like consumer segmentations. I know a lot of um, a lot of companies have customer segmentations or personas that they work with. Um, are is this done like based on those personas, or does that help them develop the personas? It could be done either way. We've done a lot of segmentation work here at Suzy where we use these statements to develop the actual personas and to identify who the the right consumers are, and then we'll report the top drivers, right, by segment. They're not always the same. We're looking at this in terms of total, right? There's, mm -hmm. It's very reasonable to expect to look at this across a range of different segments, and then that becomes an opportunity matrix very quickly. What are the attitudes or drivers that are predictive of these dependent variables with the most reach, right? It gives you a new perspective on the right message, to the right consumer at the right time? What are the things I need to focus on for this group to have the most reach? And so it can be done both ways. It's ultimately a matter of going back to what we started with, the business question. In this case, we're just looking at drivers in total, but if the business question involved and in how are there different consumers or which ones should I go after, we would be just reporting it this way. We could be reporting this in terms of an actual segmentation. Mm -hmm. How often, I mean, I know we talk a lot about how quickly consumers change, you know, given different factors like the macroeconomic environment, or, you know, obviously we just came out of a pandemic. So I'm just, I'm just curious for something like this to kind of check in with um, how consumers are feeling, what's driving their behaviors. How often would you refresh something like this? It's, I mean, this is now a philosophical question, right? <laughs> um, and I, I think it really comes back to how, how comfortable do you feel? Market research at the end of the day is really, you know, it's about confidence, right? It's a, it's a way to mitigate risk. And as long as you feel like, you know, what's driving behavior or the fundamentals of the, of a category are the same as they were the year before, then I, I would feel comfortable, you know, moving on. You also have to look at the depth of, of understanding and knowledge that you already have, right? Traditionally in my career, which is, which has been, you know, it's been around for over, well over a decade, so every three to four years is considered normal for refreshing your foundational learning, whether that's an ANU or consumer segmentation. I think in this day and age, that's getting to be a bit much, a bit long. I would be, I'd be looking for more effective ways to create this feedback loop by staying in touch and understanding what's changing more or less. A great example of this is a, is a phenomenon we've seen about the importance of emotional end benefits versus functional end benefits when we measure them through a range of different research studies. You know, when I was first starting out in my career, the right thing to always do in a survey, right, is we're talking about survey design, is to separate your functional benefits from your emotional benefits, whether it's a max diff or a ranking importance or whatever, because historically, the way I was trained is the functional ones are always so important that you don't ever get a good read on the emotional ones if you were to mix them together, right? They'll always come in last and you don't need to waste, you know, valuable research dollars to learn that. 
we continue to do that because it's been an established best practice. It's just interesting that since the pandemic, more often than not, and almost regardless of the category, we're seeing emotional and benefits being much more important or impactful than those functional ones, right? That's a fundamental change that's happened within some sort of category dynamic that would make me want to go and refresh what I understand. What do you mean? Like, what's an example of an emotional benefit? Emotional and benefit. Uh, let's go back to that example. It gives me the, makes me feel like I'm uh, in control of my health and wellness versus a functional benefit. Tastes good, right? Or comes in the form I like, right? The the emotional and benefit um, in terms of its importance and driving behaviors for for that particular example was considerably higher than any of the functional benefits you saw mm -hmm. on that and that output, you know, in this drivers. It's really about how the consumer feels, just as much as what that product does. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, I am curious. So the one, the last slide that you were showing before we kind of went back was uh, talking about the concept testing and and all of that. And so I can definitely see this approach um, very relevant when you're coming up with a new product. But I'm curious if you've ever seen any of your clients use an approach like this when they're maybe trying to troubleshoot if a product isn't performing as well as they hoped it would in the market. Um, have you ever seen a use case like this for, for that? Absolutely. Right. So we've got some slides here I can show you that are a great example of that. Um, we looked at drivers for healthy snacking, particularly buying healthy snacks that coming out of a, out of the checkout aisle, we've all been there. Right. Mm -hmm. So in this example here, what were the top predictors of someone looking for better ways to manage their health and wellness? Those are snackers. Um, and interest in purchasing a good for me snack. We had some, some top drivers there, which provided context. Then we look at, just like we did before, the drivers of satisfaction, right? Drivers of satisfaction for a snack that was bought at the checkout aisle. The consumers, we derived this from, we didn't ask them, but it was really important that they were looking forward to consuming that snack. There was something about that anticipation, right? Um, you know, there's something about already loving that brand. Think about that. Like this is a snack. It's not just about satiation. It's about the anticipation. It's about the reliving of that brand, right? For a healthy snack, it's about believing that that brand understands nutrition. The interesting, you know, especially in this day and age, something about immunity came up. Immunity and energy, right? The belief that you're getting an immunity boost and an energy boost was an important part of creating a satisfaction for a snack. Right. Or, you know, being, you know, having products that they're already satisfied with. There's this whole range of experiences that we were able to pull out of this study to learn about what is a satisfying experience. Just like we looked at that pool experience. When we look at a satisfaction experience, we can see the critical drivers of that. In this example, we've done it by the subcategories. Right. But if you're a brand or a subcategory, you can start to see, look, this is what's important to satisfying my my consumer, what are the ones that I'm performing well or not performing well on? This becomes an amazing diagnostic tool. When you know what levers to pull, you better find out how well you are pulling them from the consumer's perspective. In this case, you know we're seeing uh, single serve beverages as something that they're looking forward to consuming as that top predictor of, of satisfaction. Now, maybe it has to do with thirst, right? Um, but you can start to see that you know what those experiences are and where you're strong and where you're weak. A lot of this white space here where no one is over indexing, there's no ownership, you know, in this area, there's opportunity here as well, right? Mm -hmm. Got to be able to create that anticipation for your, your snack bar, right? Um, you've got to be able to like, you know, get into the consumer's minds by creating the experiences that you know are predictive of that outcome, right? Mm -hmm. So this sure. becomes almost like a checkup, like a brand checklist, right? If you will, on, on where it is and I'm performing well or not. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's interesting because as you're talking, I'm hearing a couple um, trends sort of bubble up. Like you talked about immunity or you mentioned something about single serve. So I'm curious, um, and this kind of like parlays into sort of the next section here and, and how to uncover trends, um, asking the right questions and surveys. But how how can researchers design surveys to uncover trends like that? Right. So let's let's go back to our faces now. Right. So how can you uncover a trend? Um, well, trends are are a function of time. Right. So that's the other thing to keep keep in mind. It's really about understanding what is relevant 
and what is you know popping in terms of things that are changing over a period of time, right? So you know, is this is for example, we just saw with the health and wellness and vitamin and mineral supplement, is control or being concerned about your health and wellness is that is that a trend that's going on just as a result of COVID or is that a real driver of the category? The way you're going to find that out is well, one, we already have derived that this is important to driving category behavior. Now we have to start to track it over time, right? So is this a trend? If, if you know, as soon as this pandemic's over and people are back to the way they go and I rerun this driver analysis, you know, and I keep checking on what's, what's changing in consumer behavior, if that drops off, that was a fad, right? That was, that was a, a, a symptom of what was going on around us. But if, you know, feeling like you're in control or these, or these elements don't go away, they become core foundations that are going to go from a trend to actually shaping what your category dynamics are about. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Interesting. So, um, are there any trends that you've seen bubble up recently, just from all of the work that you're doing? Anything interesting? Yeah, we see, you know? So going from the client side to the vendor side, you get to see behind the curtain a lot. And I mentioned, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the, the trend in general here, it's not, you know, this isn't, I'm not talking about like a, a TikTok theme. Um, I'm talking about like an overall trend about consumers is the importance of emotional and benefits. Um, I mentioned, you know, in traditional training, it's always been, you know, important that you separate your functional and your emotional and benefits, um, usually because the functional ones are so important. How consumers feel is more important than it ever was, right? How, you, how that experience actually creates an emotional reaction is really what's driving a lot of brand success right now. I can't underemphasize that enough. Like this is, it, the emotional end benefits doesn't matter if demographics are something that is here to stay. That is not a trend. You know, over the last two years, it's only becoming more important. Um, other trends I, I think that we're seeing a lot of is um, around credibility, right? What I'm finding a lot now is that, that if there's a brand sells something that a consumer isn't quite sure about how it works or what it does, like if there's some sort of like, you know, mode of action that isn't like, you know, intuitive right off the bat, and you'd be surprised how many products are out there. Consumers start to default to other things, right? To 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 make a decision. Usually, it's the brand status or what kind of retail environments they're in, right? So that's another thing that I'm seeing quite a bit of as well, right? Is the things that consumers use to make their decisions through these types of driver studies is more and more about the brand itself rather than just a list of functional benefits or statements, right? How a consumer is feeling about your brand and how they perceive that is, is going to be as impactful, if not more so than the list of, of claims that you list on your package. Mm. Do you think that's a function of just the world that we live in with social media and just so much information overload? Oh, I absolutely like, yeah, it's, there's so much noise out there, right? Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons that you know, we're talking about foundational studies. One of the reasons it's so important to reset and refresh every couple of years, probably not waiting for, right? Is because the rate of change in the marketplace is increasing every day, right? Mm -hmm. There's more retail channels, more sources of information that are, are changing of relevance. Every day you're having more and more opportunities to have branded touch points. There's more and more noise yeah. out there. Right. And I think because of that and all the noise, consumers have different sets of you know, information sets that they're using to make these decisions, whether it's conscious or subconscious. And seeing things like the emotional and benefits being so important or perceptions of a brand being so important are indicators of this. Like this is a symptom. It makes sense. If there's too much information out there, I'm going to rely on the things that, that I know. Right. How I feel and what I think of this brand. Right. Before, you know, it, it's intuitive only after the fact. But yes, I definitely think it has to do with the the amount of, of noise out there. Yeah. And consumers are just, I feel, more complex than ever before because of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I know the holidays are coming up. Um, so question about, about just holiday trends. So I know like back to school season is often indicative of how holiday shopping season will go. We're obviously in sort of a macroeconomic um, downturn. Um, in our August white paper that we wrote, we learned that most parents, 64% um, of them said that they need to adjust their spending to account for inflation in order to pay for school supplies. So I'm just curious, like from your perspective, how can researchers carry through insights from earlier shopping seasons um, and design surveys to uncover trends for this holiday season and beyond? 
Right. So it's now it's about understanding and identifying what are what's important when it comes to making these decisions. Right. So you've already identified a number of consumers who are having to make this, you know, change the way they plan to spend right off the bat. That's a great audience to target. Right. So, if you, you know, there's going to be in that Venn diagram of, of people that you need to win with that are reconsidering the ways they consider what their purchases are. Right. This is a great way to now start to look at what the experiences are that matter to them. Right. So, you know, you've already identified someone that you need to win with. Now, what are the ranges of experiences? How are they feeling? What's the context to talk to them? Right. What's important to them about the category you're in? How do they feel about that category? What are the at the end of the day, if they're going to have to make a choice and, you know, shell out hard earned dollars? What are the functional benefits and how is that the emotional benefits? How is that going to make them feel and what's most important? Now is the time to figure out what is the right balance of, of messaging and of, of end benefits that you should be deriving so that you can win during this, this period of, of transition, right? It's, it's inflation is affecting all of us. So understanding what the values are and deriving what's going to be predictive of the behavior, behaviors that matter to you is going to be a great way to stay ahead. Yep. Makes sense. You have, um, I know you have a kid. What's the hot toy this year? Do you know? <laughs> it's, <laughs> My kid is now the age of, of video games, right? So it's the, yeah, what's, the latest, too. what's the latest game. Um, uh, so yeah, there's a, a rumored new release of new courses for Mario Kart. And that's what I'm hearing about right now. Um, uh, gotcha. So that's the, that's the, the hot item. Yes, I am just embarking on, on that myself. So <laughs> um, cool. Any other, um, any other thoughts just around trends in general um, and how, you know, any recommendations for uncovering trends um, for our clients? Like what, should, should people be running brand tracker type of studies or tr tracker, any kind of tracker type of studies on their own to uncover trends or use outside I think, sources? I think tr trends are a great way to, update your list of experiences and perceptions that are important, you know, as th different trends come and go, you can get a read on how relevant they are to you by putting them into this type of framework, measure what drives behaviors and then how well are you performing against them can be done by looking at trends, right? The other thing is I wouldn't use trends as something that's going to necessarily steer the, you know, your brand ship, right? Trends are, are, are one thing, you need to understand what they what they actually mean in terms of your brand. It's a fundamentally different thing than to be meeting needs versus creating demand, right? And if you fully understand what it is that's driving a trend, that gives you new insight into what drives behavior, right? So I would much rather be on the demand creation side rather than just meeting need side. So it's about using these tools and leveraging what you can learn from trends using derived approaches and through survey designs that really focus on the experiences consumers can answer to give you that control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And sometimes it's hard to tell too, whether something is a trend or a fad and like whether a brand should go all out and, um, you know, try to capitalize on a trend. I'm thinking of, you know, NFTs, which have been really big. I don't know if it's still, you know, as big as it was or starting to fade, but, um, you know, how, how, any, any advice on like how brands can kind of gauge whether like they should be like trying to capitalize on a specific trend and, and how to kind of go about that? Yeah. So keeping it into the framework that we talked about is you understand what the drivers of, assuming you understand now and measured what the drivers of our specific behavior, you can now go and articulate innovations or brand messages that, that actually take advantage or, or, or co-opt that trend and start to test them, right? It's better to fail fast and hard during research than it would be, you know, in the real world. And mm -hmm. articulating those trends or that innovation around the drivers that you know to drive behavior is the way to find out, right? Yeah, something that's going to be trending in a certain way is, is probably going to get a lift if it's, if it's popular. But when you start to ask those diagnostic questions, right? Does this do X, Y, Z? Does it make you feel this way? Which you know is what's important to your brand category is where you're going to learn if you can really take advantage of that trend or not, right? So going into a research environment with that feedback loop, articulating the components of the trend around what you've derived about consumer behavior is your way to find out if there, if this thing's got legs. Is this a trend that, that's relevant to you and your brand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, super helpful. Thank you. All right. Well, um, let's kind of recap. I, I just want to kind of go back to the beginning again and just sort of reiterate, um, you know, with your experience building surveys, um, I know you have a ton, again, on both the client side and um, with Susie, 
do you have um, any last parting kind of tips for researchers just starting out and drafting their first survey? Yes, right. So one, start off with that business question, right? Don't go down a rabbit hole of, 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 of producing all kinds of statistics and results that aren't going to answer the actual business question itself. So as you go through your survey development, keep in mind, how is this question that I'm crafting right now going to help me answer that business question? Right. Two, make sure that you're asking the right respondents when you start to build your screener. No matter how well you articulate those questions, if that sample doesn't reflect some sort of reality that's critical to your business, it's not going to be relevant, right? And then three, make sure that you tell the story. Pull your statistics and the stuff that you learned from that survey into a, into a story that's going to be easy for your business stakeholders to follow. Super helpful. Thank you. Um, if you could add any feature to survey design, what would it be? I'm going to look into like some sort of future state where I can make sure that the people that I'm serving with my survey have some sort of observation signal around them. Like, you know, I know for a fact they purchased this or they did this because the first rule of good research is to never ask a question when you can observe it. Right. And we all know that the world around us with all the tips, different types of purchase data and, and data sets that are out there, being able to integrate into those to choose my sample would be like the first thing that I would, I would want if I could have anything. It would reduce the amount of screening questions I have to ask and create all kinds of dependent variables for me. <laughs> Very good. I love it. Um, well, thank you so much. Any parting thoughts before we wrap up? No, I know we're getting into the end of the year, Q4, with planning season. So good luck, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I know we are in the thick of Q4 already. So Thank you so much. That's all the time that we have. Um, so thank you again, Will, and thank you to everybody for attending. If you have any questions at all about today's program, please feel free to reach out to the Suzy team and we will see you next time. Thank you thank so you. much.